Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to film a book haul for the month of March. I'm doing this a little early this month. I usually wait until the very end of the month so I can talk about anything I brought into my library during the course of the month, but circumstances just made it really easy for me to film this now. And anything else that I might purchase in the month of March will just have to wait until April. It is what it is. It's going to be fine. There's plenty to talk about as it is. My book hauls have been getting larger since we expanded my library. I'll have the video down below with a tour of the new library. And I, it's been an interesting change. I notice that since I've gotten a lot more space for books, I have sort of become more of a collector and I'm looking for books and curating books and editions of books that I would like to have in my library. And that has been a sort of interesting shift. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that in a video. But I'm thinking differently about how I acquire books and what they mean and what they mean for my library. There are a lot more library builders and things like that. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see if this holds over time. I am thinking that once the novelty of the library wears off and I've built up some of these library builders, things will slow down again and my book halls will probably get smaller. But in the meantime, there's a lot to talk about. And since there's a lot to talk about, let's dive right in and talk about the books. We're going to talk about some things that are uh, interesting for my Pulitzer project first, and then we'll uh, get into books that are not related to that, and then we'll, we're going to loop around to the Pulitzer project one more time just so I can show off a pretty book at the end. But there will be a bunch of books that are not related to it in the middle. So the first two books I want to talk about, and I'm linking them together because they are from the same author and they are here for the same purpose. They are both by John Hohenberg. There's the Pulitzer Diaries, Inside America's Greatest Prize, and the Pulitzer Prizes, A History of the Awards in Books, Drama, Music, and Journalism Based on the Private Files Over Six Decades. Again, both are by John Hohenberg. So John Hohenberg was actually the administrator of the prizes from 1950 to 1976, and he was a professor of journalism at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. So toward the end of his run, he wrote these books. One of them, he also wrote a biography, but these are much more specifically about the Pulitzer Prizes, and I think they'll be helpful as I work through my Pulitzer Prize project and do deep dives on the books that have won to have some of the perspective in here. I don't know yet if I'm going to actually read through them cover to cover or if I'm going to kind of go through piecemeal year by year and uh, find relevant information. I would actually like to read them, but I don't know when I'm going to find the time to do that. But um, they are specifically here because of the Pulitzer Prize Project and because I just find this interesting. And, you know, that is what it is. Um, one is published by Syracuse, and I believe the other one is published by Columbia itself. Let's make sure. Yeah, the Columbia University Press. Usually in book halls, I read a little bit from the opening of the book, and I'll do that here. But, you know, these are nonfiction books, and they're here for a very specific reason. So, chapter one, The Grand Scheme, 1902 to 1916, The Germ of an Idea. Joseph Pulitzer was restless and dissatisfied. For some years, he had thought of making a special contribution to the, for the lasting benefit of his profession of journalism. A grand scheme, as he called it. And we'll leave it at that for the Pulitzer Prizes. And then the Pulitzer Diaries begins as such. And actually, this is a signed edition, I should mention. Not that that means anything to anyone but me, but I find it interesting. Here we go. I'm not going to do the forward... Part 1, Expanding Horizons. Chapter 1, The Big Prize. Toward the end of my fourth year as a Columbia University professor, my dean asked me to join him at a meeting of the advisory board on the Pulitzer Prizes. I wouldn't have much to do, he said. In my diary, I wrote that he'd suggested, maybe you can help me by taking a few notes. It sounded interesting, particularly because I had no classes that sunny April morning in 1954, but I still had a large pile of student papers to read. No matter, the dean's business came first. So those are very, you know, niche books for me, but hopefully you still find them interesting. That takes us to our first book book, but it still relates to my Pulitzer project. It's The Sympathizer by Viet Ton win. This is one of the recent winners of the book prize. And if you follow along, another thing that's happened since I expanded my library is I, I decided somewhere along the way in my Pulitzer project that I want to have a copy of all of the books that have won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And 
after a run of uh, book purchasing and specifically Franklin Library book purchasing, I managed to have a copy of all but two. And this is the second to last one. So now the only book I need to complete my Pulitzer Library is The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. And I'm allowing myself to be really picky with these last two because I kind of want to have nice editions now. There was a time early on when I would just grab copies, didn't really care what condition they were in because it wasn't really about that curating and having nice editions. It was more like, this will be helpful when I get around to reading this. So I waited because the local used bookstore near me has actually had copies of The Sympathizer, but they haven't been in great condition. So I waited for one to show up that actually is in nice condition. It is a little interesting because I can tell from the way the book is made, it's going to get you know, wrinkled and creased and all that stuff pretty quickly, but at least it's starting from a good point. If you're unfamiliar with this book, here is the blurb that they have about it. The narrator, a communist double agent, is a man of two minds, a half French, half Vietnamese army captain who arranges to come to America after the fall of Saigon, and while building a new life with other Vietnamese refugees in Los Angeles, is secretly reporting back to his communist superiors in Vietnam. The Sympathizer is a blistering exploration of identity and America, a gripping espionage novel, and a powerful story of love and friendship. I did read this when it was first released, and I thought it was okay. I didn't love it. This is something that I will be revisiting, and it will be interesting to revisit it as well, because now they are making an HBO miniseries out of the book, and I think that might be interesting timing to try to do a reread of the book, so we'll see how that goes. This is published by, hold on, I need to get to the copyright page. It is published by Grove Press, and here is a little bit of the opening. Chapter one, I am a spy, a sleeper, a spook, a man of two faces. Perhaps not surprisingly, I am also a man of two minds. I am not some misunderstood mutant from a comic book or a horror movie, although some have treated me as such. I am simply able to see any issue from both sides. Sometimes I flatter myself that this is a talent, and although it is admittedly one of a minor nature, it is perhaps also the sole talent I possess. That is the opening of The Sympathizer, a Pulitzer Prize winner by Viet Thanh Nguyen, who is actually on the Pulitzer board now. So not only is he a recent winner of the Pulitzer Prize, he is now one of the people who helps decide who wins Pulitzer Prizes, which is very interesting indeed. Now we're going to take a break from the Pulitzer books and go into other new releases and things that caught my attention. And we're going to talk about Becoming Ted by Matt Cain. First, if you follow along, you know that The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle was one of my favorite books that I read last year. I'll have a link to that video down below. It was also one of Joel's favorite books of the year. And uh, we, we were both really curious to read another one. Unfortunately, this was not released in the U.S. the way The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle was. You know, I'm sure rights issues are complicated, but... It is released in the UK, but not in the US, which was the, the, the case for The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle. So we pre-ordered a copy from the UK, and it arrived here. And I'm looking forward to reading this. Here is what they say about this online. Ted Ainsworth has always worked at his family's ice cream business in the quiet Lancashire town of St. Luke's-on-Sea. He doesn't even like ice cream, though he's never told his parents that. When Ted's husband suddenly leaves him, the bottom falls out of his world. But what if this could be an opportunity to put what he wants first? This could be the chance to finally follow his secret dream, something Ted has never told anyone. And if it's anything like The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle, it will be a really affirming and sweet story. This is an autographed edition of the book, which is pretty fun. And this is uh, published by um, Headline Publishing Group. Here's a little bit of the opening. I'm not going to do the prologue. We're going to jump to chapter one. Ted Ainsworth lets out a contented sigh. As he contemplates the scene before him, a grin creeps over his face. It's Sunday morning, and he, he and his husband Giles are at home in their super king-sized bed. Ted propped up on a stack of gunmetal gray pillows, Giles curled up around the matching duvet. And we'll leave it at that. That's the opening of Becoming Ted by Matt Cain. I'm really excited about this book. Would like to read it at some point this year because, again, I loved The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle. And I think Matt Cain has a nice mixed balance of serious storytelling that really means something and also being a little bit sweet and sort of escapist. And, uh, you know, you need sweet sometimes. And he does that well based on The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle. Now... I 
apologize because someone on the channel brought this book to my attention in a comment, and I didn't write down their name right away. And the you used to be able to, in the back end of YouTube where you manage your channel, um, search for comments much more easily. And they did an update a couple of years ago, and it's been a lot more difficult uh, then. So if you don't know the video that uh, the comment originally came from, it becomes very difficult to find that comment. So I apologize to the person who recommended this book. I'm trying to be better about noting down names quickly. Um, but this came from a commenter. It's called Whose Names Are Unknown. It's a novel by Sonora Babb. And this uh, came about because I am currently reading The Grapes of Wrath for my Pulitzer Prize project. And uh, this has an interesting connection to The Grapes of Wrath. Sonora Babb was a social worker in California. She's originally from Oklahoma, I believe. And she was doing interviews with people who had been displaced and were living in camps uh, because of the exodus from Oklahoma to California during the Dust Bowl. And she was giving notes about these interviews to her boss, and she didn't know it, but her boss was giving her notes to John Steinbeck. So she eventually wrote this novel about her experiences with these people and what they had experienced, and uh, no one would publish it because, as they said, The Grapes of Wrath is already out there and we're not going to compete with that. So her book ended up getting shelved. And it was only published in 2005. And I believe in the introduction, it says that no one really knows if John Steinbeck used her notes or not, but it is an interesting connection um, for sure. And I think this will be an interesting book to read as a sort of companion or an addendum to my Grapes of Wrath um, deep dive for my Pulitzer Prize project. Here's what they say online. Sonora Babb's long-hidden novel, Whose Names Are Unknown, tells an intimate story of the High Plains farmers who fled drought dust storms during the Great Depression. Written with empathy for the farmer's plight, this powerful narrative is based upon the author's first-hand experience. And I'm really looking forward to reading this as well. There is an audio of it on script, but I wanted to have a copy of the book as well. I'm going to skip past the introduction. Part 1, Oklahoma Panhandle. Although the old man had raised a fair crop of broom corn that summer and the price per ton was better than usual, by the time the year's debts were paid and a little money kept back to send to the mail order houses for winter needs, nothing was left. This was the way every dry farmer lived from year to year, earning only enough for food and clothes and little enough of these. Good seed must be bought for the next season and taxes were due. Taxes were a year long ogre, and more often than not, the crop did not yield enough to keep them paid up. That's the opening of whose names are unknown by Sonora Babb. Let's move on to the next one, which is rec also a recommendation from a commenter, but this time I did manage to note it down. Uh, it was Ann Gibson who recommended this first. It's a minor chorus, a novel by Billy Ray Belcourt. I forgot to mention that Whose Names Are Unknown is published by Oklahoma University Press. And this is published by Norton. It's a tiny little thing, should be very easy to read. Let me read you what was said about it online, because I think that is really going to let you know why I was interested in this book. In the stark expanse of northern Alberta, a queer indigenous doctoral student steps away from his dissertation to write a novel, informed by a series of poignant encounters, a heart-to-heart -heart with fellow doctoral student River over the mounting pressure placed on marginalized scholars, a meeting with Michael, a closeted man from his hometown whose vulnerability and loneliness punctuated the realities of queer life on the fringe. Woven throughout these conversations are memories of Jack, a cousin caught in the cycle of police violence, drugs, and survival. Jack's life parallels the narrator's own. The possibilities of escape and imprisonment are left to chance with colonialism stacking the odds. A minor chorus introduces a dazzling new literary voice whose vision and fearlessness shine much needed light on the realities of indigenous survival. I mean, so much of that sounds really interesting to me. The reason it was recommended in the first place is that I read Ducks, which was Katie Beaton's memoir of two years she worked on the oil fields in Alberta. And that was sort of the connection for the recommendation. But there are a lot of reasons this jumped out as something that I would like to read. And I got myself a copy of the book. And I'm really looking forward to reading it again. It's a tiny little thing. So hopefully I will manage to fit it in at some point this year. But we'll see how that goes. Here we go. A guard handcuffs me and pushes me away from the visitor's station. In my unit, there's a small room just off the foyer with a glass ceiling. When it's sunny, I sit in there and think about everything that's ha ever happened to me. 
When I woke up this morning, I felt the heat before I opened my eyes and knew the sky was blue. If I'm allowed, I think I'll stay in there for the rest of the day. That's the opening of a minor chorus by Billy Ray Belcourt. Really looking forward to that. And now for a change of pace, I hauled a book that I've already read. And I just wanted to have a copy in my library. It's The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. I really liked this book a lot. It did a lot of what The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle did for me. It is genuinely funny, like laugh out loud funny in a lot of parts. Um, there's a balance of seriousness and funniness and, you know, sincerity and a little bit of drama that feels really nice and affirming and comforting even as it is really grappling with some difficult issues, including grief. So you have this guy, Patrick, who is the gunkle of the title. Gunkle is gay uncle. His best friend from college ended up marrying his brother. And unfortunately, she ended up getting cancer young and has just recently died. So during the course of her treatment and death, it turns out that Patrick's brother became addicted to painkillers. So he asks Patrick if he will take his two children in and watch them for the summer while he is in rehab. So during this really critical period of grief where the children are trying to figure out how to navigate a world without their mother, uh, they are also temporarily without their father and living with Patrick, who has never had kids, and is quietly dealing with his own grief. First, because this mother who died uh, was also his best friend, and he has now lost her as well. And because she wasn't his wife or she wasn't his mother, people don't always acknowledge that there was a connection between the two of them. But he's also kind of quietly grieving the loss of... Um, they weren't married, uh, but boyfriend feels not quite up to the level of emotional relationship that they had. Like, they basically were partners. Um, but he lost him a couple of years ago. And again, there's a sort of unseen grief there because people don't take their relationship all that seriously because they weren't married and because it was a gay relationship. And for, there are many reasons. So this is really a book about processing grief and finding ways to move on with your life, but also carry the person you've lost with you. It's also genuinely funny. Patrick is a very outsized character. He's wearing a caftan here, uh, uh, which he does around the pool sometimes. And I just thought the dynamic was really sweet. The kids are portrayed in a very realistic and interesting way. And I, I liked this book a lot. The audio was also fantastic. Stephen Rowley actually reads it and he does a fantastic job as well. I think they are making a movie of this and I really hope they cast Michael Yuri as the lead character. I think it's just a really fun book. And because I loved it so much, I wanted to have a copy for my shelf. And this is published by G.P. Putnam's and Sons. Here is the opening of the book. All right, here goes nothing. Patrick held his phone in landscape mode and waited for the autofocus to find Maisie and Grant. The children looked slight, smushed together as they were, even Maisie, who was already nine. If the camera added 10 pounds and Patrick had spent enough time in front of the cameras to know the old cliche to be true, then he was his was irreparably defective. Maisie brushed her hair out of her face, six weeks with him in Palm Springs, and it was already lighter from the desert sun. Grant mindlessly tongued to the space where his tooth used to be. And that is the opening of The Gungle by Stephen Rowley. A really sweet book. I would recommend it if you have not read it yourself. Then we get to a little bit of that sort of curating and library building, because I really don't have any intention to read this book at some point, but I do at some point want to read more Margaret Atwood. So I found this copy of Cat's Eye, a nice hardcover edition of it at my local used bookstore, and I really couldn't resist because that is part of this new uh, sense of curating editions that are nice. A hardcover copy of a Margaret Atwood is just a kind of fun thing to have. And I'm double checking. Yeah, this is not a first edition. Oh, it actually, this is a first edition. It's a first edition of Cat's Eye. So for that, I thought it would be an interesting to have, thing to have. It's a library builder all the way. I don't have immediate plans to pick this up. But look at what a fun copy of the book that is. Here's what it says online about this. Disturbing, humorous, and compassionate, Cat's Eye is the story of Elaine Risley, a controversial painter who returns to Toronto, the city of her youth, for a retrospective of her art. Engulfed by vivid images of the past, she reminisces about a trio of girls who initiated her into the fierce politics of childhood and its secret world of friendship, longing, and betrayal. Elaine must come to terms with her own identity as a daughter, a lover, an artist, and a woman, but above all, she must seek release from her haunting memories. It sounds really interesting. And I do, I think if I were to pick up a Margaret Atwood book tomorrow, it would probably be Oryx and Crake, 
but this does sound really interesting. And the fact that I now have a copy, it is certainly climbing up the ranks of books of hers that I would be interested in. By the way, this is published by Doubleday. At least this edition is. Here we go with the opening. Cat's Eye, Part 1, Iron Lung. Time is not a line, but a dimension, like the dimensions of space. If you can bend space, you can bend time also. And if you knew enough and could move faster than light, you could travel backward in time and exist in two places at once. That is the opening of Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood and this really fun edition of it that I found. Now, if you remember from my book haul last month, which will be linked down below, by the way, I decided that Louise Erdrich is an author. I would really like to have all copies of her books and eventually, at some point, read all of her books. And I think that would be a really interesting way of approaching my Pulitzer Prize project for The Night Watchman. But that's a lot of extra stuff on my plate, so I don't have plans to get to it. So you could kind of call these library builders. I just think she's an author that I would like to... Um, have on my shelves like a copy of everything she's written and eventually read everything that she's written as well. So this is the Master Butcher's Singers Singing Club. Having survived World War I, Fidelis Waldvogel returns to his quiet German village and marries the pregnant widow of his best friend killed in action. With a suitcase full of sausages and a Master Butcher's precious knife set, Fidelis sets out for America. In Argus, North Dakota, he builds a business, a home for his family, which includes Ava and four sons, and a singing club consisting of the best voices in town. When the old world meets the new, in the person of Delphine Watska, the great adventure of Fidelis's life begins. Delphine meets Eva and is enchanted. She meets Fidelis, and the ground trembles. These momentous encounters will determine the course of Delphine's life and the trajectory of this brilliant novel. So let's do a little bit from the opening. Actually, I'm, I can't remember if this is a first edition or, or not. It is part, published by HarperCollins, and it is a first edition of the book. Here we go. Part one, The Last Link. Fidelis walked home from the Great War in 12 days and slept 38 hours once he crawled into his childhood bed. When he woke in Germany in late November of the year 1918, he was only a few centimeters away from becoming French on Clemenceau and Wilson's redrawn map, a fact that mattered nothing compared to what there might be to eat. That is the opening of The Master Butcher's Singing Club by Louise Erdrich. Definitely a book that uh, is going to cause confusion in a lot of people. Like Howard's End, you always want to put an apostrophe there, but there isn't an apostrophe. So just, you know, something interesting. Then, again, going back to the idea of curating books that I would like to have in my library, I finally found a copy of True Grit by Charles Portis. I read this book on audio a couple of years ago, and actually Donna Tartt, who wrote The Goldfinch, is a huge fan of True Grit, and she read the audio of True Grit, which is kind of fun. And... It's such a good book. I, I'm not a huge Western fan, but this is a really good one. And I've wanted to have a copy for my bookshelves for years. And I was quietly checking every time I went to my local used bookstore to see if one had turned up. Finally, one turned up. And I'm really happy to have it here. If you are unfamiliar, uh, I believe Maddie is Maddie Ross is um, the protagonist of the book. She's a very young girl. Her father is killed, and she hires... Rooster Cogburn, a sort of bounty hunter, um, who and a, a rep, reputable man of grit, uh, to get revenge, and she insists on following along. It's a really great book. Um, also, the most recent adaptation from the Coen Brothers is a really good book as well. I would definitely recommend it. Maddie Ross is a really fantastic character. I just love her a great deal. This edition, by the way, is from. The Overlook Press, and here is a bit from the beginning. People do not give it credence that a 14-year-old girl could leave home and go off in the wintertime to avenge her father's blood, but it, did, but it did not seem so strange then, although I will say it did not happen every day. I was just 14 years of age when a coward going by the name of Tom Cheney shot my father down in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and robbed him of his life and his horse and $150 in cash money, plus two California gold pieces that he carried in his trouser band. That's the opening of True Grit and a bit of an introduction to the voice of Maddie Ross. Again, just a really great literary character. Continuing the idea of library building, curating, and all of that stuff, Joel had to travel again for work recently, and he stopped into a used bookstore that had some copies of Franklin Library books, and he found three that were really interesting to me. The first one is Giant by Edna Ferber. Now, if you follow along, I recently read Fanny herself. I have a full review of that book. I'll link it down below. 
loved it. Really loved it. Can't wait to read more of um, Edna Ferber's books. I also have a copy of So Big, which was her Pulitzer winner, uh, on my Pulitzer shelf in a Franklin Library edition. If you don't follow along already, I'm obsessed with these Franklin Library editions. Look at how pretty this book is. All of them are gorgeous and have a very similar style, but are differentiated enough that it's just, it's just fun. And they all open with illustrations. This one just has a kind of saddle. My joke to Joel was, is that Bronco Henry's <laughs> saddle? Um, it's just fun. I I really love these editions of these books. And Edna Ferber is an author I really want to read more of. And this is one of, if not her biggest novels, uh, definitely one of them, because it, it was at a adapted into a movie with James Dean and Elizabeth Taylor, and it's probably mostly famous for that. Uh, when larger-than-life cattle rancher Jordan Bick Benedict arrives at the family home of sharp-witted but genteel Virginia socialite Leslie Linton to pur purchase a racehorse, the two are instantly drawn to each other. But for Leslie, falling in love with a Texan was a lot simpler than falling in love with Texas. Upon their arrival at Bick's ranch, Leslie is confronted not only with the oppressive heat and vastness of Texas, but also by the disturbing inequity between runaway rant riches and the poverty and racism suffered by the Mexican workers on the ranch. Leslie and Bick's loving union endures against all odds, but a reckoning is coming and a price will have to be paid. A sensational and enthralling saga, Ferber masterfully captures the essence of Texas with all its wealth and excess, cruelty and prejudice, pride and violence. Really looking forward to reading this. Here's a bit from the opening. This March day, the vast and brassy sky, always spangled with the silver glint of airplanes, roared and glittered with celestial traffic. Gigantic though they, they, though they loomed against the white-hot heavens, there was nothing martial about these winged mammoths. They were merely private vehicles bearing nice little alligator jewel cases and fabulous gowns and overbred furs. No sordid freight sullied these four-engined family jo jobs whose occupants were Dallas or Houston or Vientecito or Waco women in Paris gowns from Neiman Marcus and men from Amarillo or Corpus Christi or San Angelo or Benedict in boots and Stetsons and shirt sleeves. That's the opening of Giant by Edna Ferber. Really glad I have this handsome edition of the book. Then we have My Antonia. Now, I actually already had a paperback copy of My Antonia. However, it is a book that I, I enjoy. And how do you say no to this really pretty edition of the book? If you're unfamiliar with My Antonia, I'm a big fan. I'll read you a little bit of the blurb and hopefully that will convince you to go seek out a copy of it for yourself. An unconventional novel of prairie life, My Antonia tells the story of a remarkable woman whose strength and passion epitomized the pioneer spirit. Antonia Shimerda returns to Black Hawk, Nebraska to make a fresh start after eloping with a railway conductor following the tragic death of her father. Accustomed to living in a sod house and toiling alongside the men in the fields, she is unprepared for the lecherous reaction to her lush sensuality provokes when she moves to the city. Despite betrayal and crushing opposition, Antonia steadfastly pursues her quest for happiness, a moving struggle that mirrors the quiet drama of the American landscape. It's not my favorite book of all time, but it is a really, I think, fantastic book and one that feels urgent and relevant even today, even though it was published a long time ago. Let's see the opening illustration, and then I'll read a little bit from the opening of this book. Uh, actually, this one, if I remember right, doesn't have an opening illustration. So, oh, here we go. There's an, one with the introduction. There you go. And then let's get to the actual book. Part one is The Shimerdas, and there is an illustration there as well. I first heard of Antonia on what seemed to me an interminable journey across the great Midland Plain of North America. I was 10 years old then. I had lost both my father and mother within a year, and my Virginia relatives were sending me out to my grandparents, who lived in Nebraska. I traveled in the care of a mountain boy, Jake Marpole, one of the hands on my father's old farm under the Blue Ridge, who was now going west to work for my grandfather. Jake's experience of the world was not much wider than mine. He had never been in a railway train until the morning when we set out together to try our fortunes in a new world. That's the opening of My Antonia by Willa Cather. Honestly, a fantastic book. Really fantastic book, if you haven't read it. And then we kind of loop back to my Pulitzer Project, because one of the other Franklin Library editions that Joel found is Rabbit is Rich by John Updike. I had not really held out any hope that there would be affordable versions of the John Updike Pulitzer winners uh, 
from the Franklin Library because they tend to be really expensive. They did the collection around 1978-79, and both of his books came later, so they were sort of special editions, um, usually signed ones. I can't remember if this one is signed. I don't think it is. Yeah, this one is not. Um, I think Rabbit at Rest is technically the first edition of the book, so that one is signed, and that's probably why it's so exorbitantly expensive. But Joel found a nice copy of this. Here's an illustration of it. I'm not too excited about reading the John Update books for my Pulitzer Prize project, um, but here's what they say about this one. Ten years after Rabbit Redux, Harry Ang Angstrom has come to enjoy prosperity as the chief sales representative of Springer Motors. The rest of the world may be falling to pieces, but Harry's doing all right. That is, until his son returns from the West and the image of an old love pays a visit to his lot. Let's do a bit from the opening and then we can put this book haul to rest. There's another illustration. Here we go. Running out of gas, Rabbit Angstrom thinks as he stands behind the summer dusty windows of the Springer Motors display room watching the traffic go by on Route 111, traffic somehow thin and scared compared to what it used to be. And I'll leave it at that because the next sentence has a curse word. I'm not, I'm not opposed to curse words, but I'm always too afraid to use them in YouTube videos because I, if you follow along, you know. But if you don't, um, or if you're new, hi. I had a video that was once flagged for language, and it was a real pain in the butt getting that taken off because I didn't actually curse in that video. And I've always been too afraid to do it ever since. But anyway, point just being, here's a copy of Rabbit is Rich. And those are all of the books that I brought into my library in the month of March. I'd love to hear what you have thought about any of these books. If you have recommendations based on any of these um, thoughts, feelings, whatever, let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.